happy Monday. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. I'm I'm told that it's spring somewhere. Um, and here I have a great egret. I uh, definitely think it's spring. You may remember these were hunted for a while for fancy plumes and hats and so forth, and you can see perhaps why. This is a uh, great egret kind of putting on a display to try and attract a mate. And uh, once they pair up, they get to work on building a nest, bringing in uh, sticks and trying to work together, get them in place. Uh, sometimes a uh, male might bring in, uh, you know, just a small uh, little bit of a uh, little stick, but the, the uh, pair of egrets still very excited about uh, uh, this addition to the nest and uh, uh, crowing happily about it. So those are some uh, some spring birds for us. Uh, are there any questions about uh, the lab? Uh, any of the assembly stuff that we've been looking at? All right, so the agenda for today, uh, on the calendar it says we're going to be talking about uh, loops and switch statements. Uh, for the most part, this is just going to involve uh, ideas that we've already talked about. It turns out that to do loops doesn't require anything different than what it takes to do conditionals. We still need to be able to uh, check some condition and then jump somewhere else in the code. And when it came to conditionals, we were already doing that, and that's going to be all we need for loops. And uh, through this, we will see the use for the other two kinds of jump instructions that I mentioned on Friday. We had direct jumps, we're just going to always jump to some particular place. We have indirect jumps, which will come up specifically with switch statements that we uh, will get to at the end. And then, of course, conditional jumps is what we mainly focused on on Friday. So before we get to that, I want to do a little bit of practice on, uh, on uh, memory. So here is a potential state of memory, registers and uh, uh, values in memory. And I'm going to write four assembly instructions here. notice that I have four instructions and for each kind of pair I have an LEA instruction and a move instruction with the same source and a different destination. And so I really uh, want you to, to think about what is the difference between LEA and move. So you might start out just by, in a sentence in your own words, writing down how you would describe the difference between LEA and move and then work out what these four instructions, uh, how they affect the values and registers and or memory. 
that are displayed here uh, because it's going to be like very useful to kind of have an intuition for what the difference between these two uh, are as we go forward. All right. Who, who can share how you think about the difference between LEA and MOVE? CJ? Uh, the LEA just doesn't think more with the be using the portal with the value it has and trying to like access the value of that address. But then the LEA would be looking at the address as the uh, as value. Exactly. Our LEA is going to compute a memory address and then just stop there and do something with that memory address value that it, that I computed. Whereas move actually goes to memory, reads or writes values in memory. Angela. I have a question on the second line. Mm -hmm. How come, like, yeah, how come it can be like those three parameters where A should be? That makes sense. Like, how, how can I agree with this? Um, yeah, so this is the kind of form of our memory address operand. It has actually four different parts. Uh, and this is shown in a, a table on the reference sheet. Uh, but we can have a displacement, a base register, an index register, and a scale. Is this color visible? Great. Uh, and so these three pieces correspond to the base register, the index register, and the scale. Uh, and what what do we do with the the, the base, index, and, and scale to get the memory address. Well, uh, so I think we just add the base and index and then we multiply by the scale. Right. Yeah, well we, we take the base plus the index times the scale. So it's just the index that gets multiplied. Uh, the value of the index register gets multiplied by the scale. Um, yeah, so does that make sense? Yeah. All right, what is the result of this first LEA instruction? What what changes about our registers or memory? Bye. Um, it computes the address of that period. Like it, it computes what that address would be mm -hmm. and then stores that address on that. Yeah, and what, what address do you think that will be? From what I remember, it seems like it would be 116. Uh, I agree. And if we put 116 in hex, what would that be? Oh, I see. 116. Yeah, because we our base register is 100, and then we're adding 4 times 4, which is 16. And if we put that 16 in base 10, that would be 10. Or sorry, if we put that 16 in base 16, we get 10. So hex 100 plus hex 10 give us hex 100 and 10. Does that make sense? So given that we have hex 110 for this, what does our move, our, our first move instruction here do? Marcus? That's actually going to get the value that the average refers to. So that'd be uh, 0, that'd be 8. And what does it do with that value? Uh, and then um, it moves that value to the register RBX. Exactly. So we end up with 8 here in, in RBX as a result of this move. How about our, our second LEA? Well, uh, uh, You... Uh, get the value of RDX, which in this case is 100, and you set RDI to that value. Exactly. And, and this is a, not a useful application of LAA. Like, how could I have written this as an as a equivalent move instruction? Bye. You could have just done parentheses, racks, RAs. 
Yeah, how could I rewrite this as a, as a move instruction? Cecilia? Um, just move RDX RDX. Yeah, that's all we're saying. Compute this as a memory address, which is literally just the value of this register. <coughs> and then copy that into, into the destination. So, and this is specifically to get us thinking very carefully about what the difference between these is. Uh, so what would our last move instruction here accomplish? Uh, move the value at uh, uh, the address 100 to RSI. And in this case, it's a set RSI 1. Exactly. We dereference this pointer, that's address 100, copy the value in memory there to RSI. Enter. Can you explain the LA and Q one again? This one here? Yeah, so LEA just says apply our memory operand formula to get whatever address this is going to be. It's a very simple formula because we just have the base register. So we have zero displacement plus the base register plus zero index register times a scale of one. So that leaves us with just the value of this register as the memory address we would compute. And LEA says stop there and then copy that memory address to wherever the destination is. So the memory address of just this register is equivalent to just taking the value of that register and moving it uh, uh, into RDI. So RDI would end up with hex 100. What if you put parentheses around the percent RDX in the move? Uh, like, like here? Yeah, like, like there. Yeah, so in this case, we have the address 100. And because it's a move, we actually dereference that pointer. We go to memory address 100. And we have a move Q. So then we take the eight bytes stored at address 100 and copy those to RSI. So the effect of this one would be to copy the value hex 1, which is what's at address 100, into RSI. If we had, uh, if this had been a move, it would also have copied 1 into RDI. Does that make sense? Other questions about this? Quack. So in the case of move, um, so the parentheses it suggests that it's um, dereferencing, right? But mm -hmm. in the case of the LEA, does it not indicate that it's dereferencing, or does it? Uh, that's correct. LEA, whenever we see parentheses, it's dereferencing unless we have an LEA instruction, which is specifically saying just compute the memory address, don't dereference. Uh, yeah, because this comes up in actual like assembly that's produced by the C compiler, it's important that we kind of understand, can recognize, okay, an LEA is not actually accessing memory, it's just computing a, a memory address. Other questions? Kevin? And um, like you said this last time, and you can't like force LEA to compute um, the actual value, right? Like say you put another cap around the key, like outside of. Um, yeah, there's no nesting of, of memory operators, so we couldn't uh, have this, the base register, be itself some like complicated expression. Uh, and similarly, LEA is just never going to access memory. That's not what the instruction does. It will always just compute, compute the address. All right. Let's take a look. this question here. So I have a C function that returns an int and takes two ints as the parameters. And I have the assembly for that uh, function here. We have a compare and jump. Um, and then just a move and return. And so does anyone remember which register will hold A and which will hold B? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, RDX, all that. Um, it is the one with the RDI, or in this case, EDI, uh, because we're dealing with four bytes, not eight. Uh, and so you can refer to the, the reference sheet, uh, which has the registers marked as like first argument, second argument, third argument on the back page. Uh, or if you enjoy mnemonics, you can think of You can think of Diane's silk dress costs eighty-nine dollars because we have RDI, RSI for the second argument, RDX for the third, RCX for the fourth, R8 for the fifth, and R9 for the sixth. That's how I remember it. You can just look at the chart if that works better for you, but. This is, this is a set of six registers that are always used to hold the arguments passed to a function. Uh, if there are any, if there are more than six arguments, uh, the uh, the ones beyond six will be placed uh, in memory, and uh, we'll we'll talk about exactly how that uh, how that works uh, later on. But uh, any more than six will will be passed via memory instead of registers. Um, so, uh, we know which register is A, which is B, so I'd like you to uh, consider this assembly and think of, okay, given the behavior it would have, which of these four names do you think would be uh, appropriately described what this function would be? Does it get the min, the max, the absolute value, or subtract and return the difference? Like we're evenly divided between min and max. I promise it's doing one of uh, it's doing one of those two. Uh, so let's discuss our neighbors and figure out which of those it is. All right. Large move toward min. That is excellent. This will this will return the smaller of the uh, of a and b. So min would be you know, a good name for it. Um, can someone share kind of how you figured out that it was that it was min and, and not max? Connor? So well I was just looking at the chart and like the jump condition for uh, JG with like the comparison is that if B, the, the second argument is greater, then you do jump. And so in this case, if the second argument is greater, you jump and you're putting the first argument as your return. Um, and if the if that jump like doesn't trigger, um, if the second argument is equal to or less than the first, then you're putting the second argument. Exactly. Um, uh, we can look and think about when will this jump, and then look at okay, in which case, in either of those cases, which uh, value actually gets returned. Is it going to be the smaller one or, or the bigger one? Uh, does this make sense? What are your What are your questions on figuring out what this assembly does? All right. So. Come back to this. So uh, let's just do the second problem here. Uh, and now I am just kind of throwing you in the deep end. There's now a loop in C, and we're doing an assembly. And there are a couple of reasons that I'm doing this. The first, as I said, we don't need any new instructions in order to implement loops. We've got jumps, we've got compares. That's 100% of what we need to make loops work. Uh, and you can think about it that if we have a loop, we'll do some instructions, and then if we're and then we'll do some test, and based on that test, we'll either jump kind of back to repeat those same instructions or kind of continue and exit the loop. And so we're used to thinking of loops 
as having kind of a the condition check first, and then the body of the loop, and then at the end of the loop we sort of magically and visibly like jump back to the top to check the condition. Uh, but when it comes to assembly, it's more often that uh, we have uh, something like structure like this, where the first thing we'll do is we'll jump down to where we actually check whether the loop condition is met. And then if the loop condition is met, we'll jump back up to where the body of the loop is. And then in executing the body, we'll just continue from what's inside the loop into doing this test again. And this is the sort of structure that we see here, and we see an example of the kind of direct unconditional jump. We have this jump here at the top, which just, no matter what, it's going to jump down to L2, to these lines of assembly. Um, this is the implementation of this kind of computing a factorial uh, function in C, so we have n, and we want to do n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, uh, and so on. Uh, and so your task is basically to figure out what should the, the two lines of assembly that kind of check the loop condition, what should those be? As this, uh, when, when we compile this factorial function, we get this sort of form where we kind of jump into the middle. We set up... Uh, uh, set up the return value, and then jump to check, do we even go into the loop at all? So I have four options here, this long dash, because Flickers doesn't let me have the answers span multiple lines. This long dash separates kind of the two instructions that would go here. So this first one says compare one RDI, and then the second line jump greater than L3. So... Uh, take a look at this, uh, and we'll uh, think about kind of what pair of assembly instructions would would make this loop work. All right, no, no uh, B or C, but lots of us for A, some for D. Uh, discuss with the neighbors why you chose the answer you did. We have unanimity. Hooray! <laughs> Good job. Nick. Okay, so this is, so like, in L3, we could remove the, the line starting with sub and put that in L2, right? Because that, like, sub sets a jump code. Uh, yes? Um, I see. You're saying, can we use this? Uh, subtraction to also determine when we jump. Um, possibly, um, as if we do this um, n minus 1, and then uh, if that is... Um, less than, maybe jump less than or, uh, or jump greater than still might work. It seems possible. Uh, then wouldn't we decrement before we run our first L3 so we could make that code work if we had a call to L3 before our jump of L2? Yeah, I think that's a good point that we um, we need to test kind of before subtracting one um, uh, for the purposes of the, of the multiplication. Um, so uh, we can look at this over on Godbolt uh, and 
and take a look at how this works. Um, and we see that the uh, GCC version 11 on basic optimization produces this, this pattern. Uh, the first question is about why these, uh, about how these two instructions make this loop happen. Kevin? Um, I think this is kind of more like how I would read uh, assembly, right? Because it always go top to bottom, and then if there's no jump, it's go to top to bottom. Like everything in line. Uh, the name doesn't matter. So the only assembly will go top to bottom. The only exceptions are jumps and function calls. Otherwise, it's just going kind of instruction after instruction after instruction. So any sort of like if statements, loops, anything that sort of changes which line of C code we're on, that would involve a jump because there's no other way to kind of change, change that. Quark? Wait, so um, after we jump to L2 and L2 tells us to jump to L3, after we do step C, where exactly do we go? Uh, so we actually, so sub Q, line six here and line eight, these are, these instructions are like right one after another. So when we do sub Q, we just proceed to the next instruction, which is this compare. So these labels are kind of, what we're looking at here is that sort of intermediate stage, the assembly, which is between the C code and the machine code. So these dot L whatevers, these are things that have been inserted by the compiler when it produced the assembly to give us this sort of human readable version of the machine code. But we can actually ask God both. Under output, I can check the box that says compile to binary. And what this does is it compiles all the way to the machine code and then uses a separate tool to disassemble, to basically recreate the assembly out of the machine code uh, that the uh, compiler produced. And this lets us see how are these jumps actually encoded when we compile them into machine code. So You'll notice that there's no uh, there's no L2 or L3 here anymore. Those have gone away, uh, and instead we see memory addresses shown after the jumps. So we see this jump goes to memory address, uh, and this is in hex 401 115, which you can see is the address of the compare. We see that the sub and compare are kind of right next to each other, and we see this jump greater than goes to 4110D, which is the multiplication instruction. So you see these jumps, once, we're, once they're in machine code, they're using memory addresses, not labels. Uh, but if we actually look at the bytes here, and these sort of letters in gray, I'll make this a little bigger, these letters in gray here are showing us the actual values of the ones and zeros in, in the machine code that uh, this instruction was, uh, uh, was encoded with. And we can see with these jumps, this says jump 401115, but that number is definitely not in this encoding. Uh, we see that this is 4110D, but also that number is not in this encoding. So what is it actually doing when it compiles these jumps? It's compiling into something that we should add to our instruction pointer if we jump. So this says add 8 to the instruction pointer. And uh, when we do that, we get the, and, and the disassembler is helpfully filling in, what do we get if we add eight to what the instruction pointer would be at this point? It would work out to this address. Similarly, this jump greater than, it's actually encoding a negative number that will add to the instruction pointer to cause it to go back. So uh, this is what it actually, is actually being sent to the machine. Uh, and so if we're kind of trying to reverse engineer assembly code, uh, we'll be kind of relying on these, these memory addresses, or you can also see it tells us how many bytes away from the start of the function. 
this isn't something else that the uh, uh, the disassembler is sort of filling in for us. Anthony. Could you explain again, like, so it gives a memory address, but it also gives, like, the 480, right? Like, are those two things, do they have similar purposes? Or like, uh, so I think it's showing, yeah, so uh, this jump is this EB08. So it's these two bytes here. Um, and this EB08 is all that is sent to the, the CPU. So we can see that this 401115, not actually something that is sent uh, to as part of the instruction. That's something uh, that this tool is sort of filling in for us based on the information available here. Um, and uh, it's getting there uh, by saying, all right, the, um, uh, the instruction pointer would move to the next line of assembly, um, but instead it should have... Um, uh, instead, it should add this amount to it, it when we jump, so instead we end up down at 115. Other questions? All right. So this is kind of the... Uh, the general idea of how we're going to uh, uh, implement our uh, our loops in assembly, and um, it's also the case that a for loop and a while loop are not uh, unless you use the uh, uh, unless you use continue. Uh, does anyone remember what continue does when you use it inside a loop? Well, it just gets the current iteration, right? Yeah, goes around to the next iteration. So if you have a continue, then for and while loops can't actually be implemented exactly the same way, uh, because skipping to the next iteration of, of a for loop involves doing the kind of increment part, whereas a while loop, you would skip whatever is kind of left in the body of the while loop. But we don't have a continue going on here. So I could say um, for int i is uh, uh, 0, i less than n, i plus plus. So I'll do less changes than that. Let's just say um, I just have the for loop do exactly what the while loop was doing, and we have exactly the same assembly that's produced. So uh, there's not, when we're looking at the assembly, we're typically not kind of, we can't necessarily tell, was this originally a while loop, was this originally a for loop? We just have, there's maybe some initialization, maybe some, uh, there's a condition, some change to uh, a variable, and whether that was in the C code or while loop or for loop, it ends up looking exactly the same in the assembly. All right. So uh, let's do uh, one more bit of practice. Um, so in this case, For simplicity, we're not going to deal with a loop, but we're going to uh, uh, see one of our kind of uh, uh, kind of instructions. If we at least think about how the compiler does this, that we haven't seen before. So I have a function where I want it to take into a point, take in a pointer to the long, and either return the value that that pointer points to, 
or if that pointer is null, return this other value instead. So sort of dereference the pointer, or if you can't, return this sort of default value. So if I, one way to write that in C, if x is null, return y, otherwise, return the value that x points to. So uh, I would like you to work with your neighbors to compile this into assembly, uh, to come up with uh, what the assembly is going to be. Uh, you'll follow the conventions where our first, uh, our first argument is which register? RDI and the second RSI and the return value RDI. All right. So following those conventions, um, I'll tell you that we put this into Godbolt. Uh, we get out six uh, assembly instructions to compile this function. Your version does not need to have exactly six, uh, but work with your neighbors to. Uh, Come up with uh, with an attempt to turn this into assembly. All right. Let's take a look at how this compiles. Move this out of our way. All right. Uh, what's the what's the first step in your assembly version of this? Uh, this function. Uh, write a name for the like beginning of the call. Uh, sure. We'll have a label uh, for the function name. Uh, how about the first instruction? I guess you don't have to initialize anything. So you can add it just with the condition. No, actually, uh, you jump, jump, back, jump down to the to the test condition for the if there. Um, yeah, we could uh, jump down to to the condition. Um, in this case, there's like nothing that we're gonna like repeat. So we typically just see the condition kind of start off, uh, be the be the first thing we do. Um, uh, who has kind of how did you how did you do this um, equals equals null condition? Oh, uh, is that conf and then parentheses um, percentage RDI and then zero x zero like that? Yeah. Not sure. Well, uh, so, uh, so would it be any different to flip whatever a B R and C R and conf in the same? Yeah, so a um, few things. Uh, typically, the order that arguments are provided at comp, kind of either way will work, but it will affect what jump you do. Because the jump is based on a specific kind of B to A relationship that you can see in, in the table. So it does kind of which order you put them in is going to determine which jump you want. Um, any suggestions on kind of ways to, to tweak this line, PJ? Do you actually have to do reference steps, or do you just compare and line those fields? Yeah, we specifically want to just get the address stored in RDI and check whether that is zero before we dereference it. Since if we dereference, if RDI turned out to be zero and we dereference it, that's going to crash our, our program. Well, and so instead of doing zero x zero, could we also do like a money sign dollar sign zero? Yeah, we actually have to do a dollar sign here because otherwise, without the dollar sign, it's treated as go get the thing at memory address zero. With the dollar sign, it's treated as the literal number zero. Uh, yeah, so we we could start off this way um, and. What was a what was a jump? Uh, the thing you explain. Like J E. Uh, yeah. Why J E? Uh, because we want to see if 
RDI and L are equal. Yeah, and we want to see does it equal zero? Uh, and then presumably we jump to some label, like L one. So we have L one down here. Uh, now let me fill in fill in the rest of this. Um, do you want to fill in from L1 or just for the L1? Uh, let's, uh, let's do both. <laughs> Which order? Oh, up to you. Okay, uh, why don't we do above L1 before we move to L1? Uh, oh, for the CMP, um, does it need a uh, defining thing? Yeah, so... Uh, if we uh, look at the what the uh, the assembly the compiler produces, it will have a queue. If we look at what the what we kind of get when we disassemble something that's been compiled all the way to machine code, we actually won't see the queue. And the reason for this is the fact that we're using RDI tells us that this is eight bytes because the register is eight bytes. So. Uh, it's often going to be implied what the size specifier is by the register name that you use. Okay. So, um, so below it, maybe uh, move. I said M O B L because it's. Is that correct? Um, it will be because they're long. Uh, so that is that would be the logical thing. Um, but in fact, a long word is the long version of the two byte word from the original x86. So a long word is four bytes. A quad word is four words. So we have eight. So yeah, we would, we would have moved Q. Um, uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, backwards compatibility uh, fun. Um, yeah, so what are, what are we moving? Uh, the dereferenced RDI comma. All right. And then RDT. And we return. I like it. How about under L1? Uh, another move Q. A non dereferenced RSI. RDX. RDT. All right. I think that um, this is looking good. Um, if we uh, we can compare how that uh, looks to um, the long without or default star x on p if this is null. And P or can star X to have null that comes from the standard lib header. All right, and so we see something identical uh, to what we had up on the board, except this first instruction. Uh, you can't see it all. <laughs> except this first instruction, which is test rather than uh, compare. So this most often, so this is equivalent. The one using compare does the correct thing. Uh, anyone uh, by the reference sheet or, or the reading um, uh, remember what, what test or, or have any suggestion for what the test instruction does? Connor? She says it's a, it's a bitwise and. Exactly. So test will take the two operands and do a bitwise and and use the result of that to set the condition codes. And this means that if we take RDI 
and AND it with RDI, what value are we, are we going to get out? RDI? Exactly. This is, we're just going to get out RDI. Uh, and then jump equal says if the result of the kind of most recent arithmetic or test or compare instruction was zero, jump. And so we and something with itself, and if that was zero, then we would jump. And so this is a very common pattern that you'll see when something is being compared to null or compared to zero, uh, because the system can do a bitwise and more efficiently than it can do a subtraction, which is what it does for the compare instruction. And so the compiler knows this, and we'll use test when we can use that to say check if something is zero, uh, rather than doing a kind of compare and, and a zero. Thank you. I'm so a little bit confused about when the feature that they each other. Um, yeah, so the, the name jump equal is a little misleading. Um, and that's why kind of the, the reference sheet lays this all out. Um, in this case, jump equal says uh, B and bitwise, the two bitwise ended together. If though if the result of that is zero, then jump equal will jump. So the names of these jumps equal, greater than, less than, and so on. Um, will kind of the, the names will match up with exactly what they do in the case of a compare, but in the case of test or other things, it may not have that same sort of intuitive matching up. Uh, and I just wanted to particularly highlight this pattern of using a test instruction and a jump equal to check if something is zero, since we will see that uh, come up in assembly. Other questions on this? Does that make sense? Marcus. Um, I know you mentioned this earlier, but I didn't really get your understanding. Why um, do you put the the dollar zero sign after REI, and not before? Uh, for the compare? Yeah. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, we wouldn't next. We could. Uh, we could have done it in either way. Uh, because we're just checking uh, it does this minus this, or the other way around, RDI minus zero. Either way, this sort of jump equal will do, will check, are these two things equal? Uh, yeah, so in this, uh, the point I was making earlier is if we were doing, say, like a jump greater than, uh, something like that, then the order of these would matter because it's doing like B is greater than like that. Other questions? All right, I have uh, managed to blow through the entire time without telling you about uh, the uh, first uh, uh, first time uh, kind of the, the U.S. Uh, United States first, where kind of the kind of territorial U.S. being sort of like fully fully constituted as it stands today. Uh, so sort of last we we checked in with it. Uh, we had kind of the original 13 colonies and Louisiana purchased from uh, Napoleon, and uh, uh, Texas had broken away from from Mexico. Uh, you had uh, James K. Polk elected president on the promise that he would uh, go to war with Mexico, get Texas, and serve one term. He did all those three things. Um, and uh, this included uh, this kind of pinkish portion of, uh, of Mexican territory as well. And this last kind of orangey piece was um, Purchased from Mexico about five years later, um, along with a treaty with Great Britain that settled this border. Uh, and so, through a combination of kind of uh, a 
aggressive warfare and uh, also many kind of non-declared wars against uh, indigenous people in various parts of this, this territory that the uh, United States was kind of expanding to uh, fill coast to coast. Uh, here's uh, some uh, paintings of uh, scenes from the, the Mexican-American War. Uh, and we also have uh, James Polk, who I mentioned, um, and Franklin Pierce, who was the obscure uh, president who uh, purchased that last little piece. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. Uh, I have office hours in the lab tomorrow night. Otherwise, I'll see you Wednesday. Thank you.